Face to face, hand to hand, film to film. Go. Welcome to the Film to Film podcast. My name is James Shergan. I am joined here today uh, by my good friend and film watcher, uh, Inyaki Lanero. How are you doing, Inyaki? Doing pretty well, James. Doing pretty well. How about you? Doing all right. Doing all right. So we are going back to Italy, uh, to Parma, Italy, in northern Italy, where we are bringing on another Dario Argento film, uh, 1987's Opera. Uh all right, so um, give you a quick synopsis, and then I want to hear uh, your basic thoughts on the film. So here we go. Uh, synopsis. A hooded fi- figure forces a young diva, Christina Marcilach, uh to watch as he murders uh, performers in a production of Verdi's opera, Macbeth. How's that? Wait, what's the name of the diva? Uh, well, I, I I read the actress's name, but her name is Betty. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry. Mm-hmm. Um, so, what do you think? Did I think of the film? Uh, this was a fun one. I I enjoyed it. Uh, it the the plot kind of worked uh, for an, and and I say this because it's an Argento film, and I I usually have issues with Argento plots. And I think this one was uh, made sense, mostly. <laughs> uh, yeah, no, I, I mean, I agree. There, there is a plot here that somewhat at least works, which is, you know, more than you can say about some of the Argento films. Um, and it's, uh, it's an interesting film. I, I actually really like this film, uh, but I think it has... Um, definitely some flaws and some things that uh, we will get to, I'm sure, as we get onto it. Uh, I, I feel like it's also a film that fills um, at this point. I mean, you can tell me what you think of this too. Uh, now that we've watched, I think this is like the tenth Argento film we've watched on this podcast, ninth or tenth, something like that. Um, it's a very, very Argento film. It's like you can feel his kind of fingerprints all over this film in just terms of like musical choices, uh, the in my opinion, occasionally inappropriate use of metal, uh, <laughs> uh, the animals in the film, like there, there are parts of this film where you're just like, Oh, Dario, what are you doing here? I mean, this is so Dario Argento. Only one person would choose to make a film called opera set in like, like Italy in like these like grand classical settings and then start playing like heavy metal, metal music while someone stabbed through the mouth. I mean, like that's some, that's a choice that only he would make. Um, so yeah, I don't know. How, how'd you feel? Uh, <laughs> did you feel like this is a very Argento film like I do? Uh, uh, yes and no. Um, or let's put it this way. Yes, I do think it was a very Argento film, but also I think it, this is Argento uh, telling the critics, uh, giving the critics a message as well. Uh, you know, you, you, in this film, you do have um, your Argento stand-in, and, and this is a reaction to something you, you just said. So you have your Argento stand-in, uh, which is uh, also a horror film, direct, uh, horror film director who is doing an opera. And everyone hates his opera because he puts a whole bunch of elements that should not go in the opera. Um, uh, as Argento does the same thing of putting a whole bunch of elements that should not be going into, you know, your classic uh, uh, old school European setting. Um, I'm not sure if that's exactly what he wanted to communicate, but if, if that was what he wanted to communicate, of course, uh, it fails in a couple of grounds, one being... Uh, <laughs> that uh, there's a huge difference between making a film and a an opera play. Although I I actually would love to see that play. You know, he was it is actually based off of his real experiences unsurprisingly. He was actually trying to uh, it says it was a failed production, so I don't know if it actually ever happened, but he was trying to put on a Macbeth uh, sometime in the mid 80s and supposedly the stills of it show him with like a bunch of uh they're not crows i guess they're ravens uh <laughs> so he was trying to do a bunch of wacky stuff so i think he probably based uh i mean clearly that director uh coming from horror movies and stuff is is it is not a coincidence i mean that is uh uh certainly based off of him and the actor who plays uh the director in this film has said uh that he based a lot of his 
mannerisms and stuff off of Dario Argento too. So mm. uh, Ian Charlson is his name, playing Marco, uh, the director. So uh, no coincidence there. Uh, did you like that aspect of it? Uh, I, I actually did not think about it until now. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, you brought it up, man. I know. I did not think about it until now. Um, I mean, uh, I, I thought, e even thinking to it, uh, the, the director is kind of a dick. He's kind of an idiot. So I, I wonder if it's, you know, are you is kind of poking fun of himself on that? Uh, the I, I would love to actually see that play because it does look like an amazing um, production Good. yeah I mean at worst you're just like oh my god this play is just batshit insane <laughs> and maybe it doesn't work <laughs> maybe when he when he brings on like uh, the metal band to be like the orchestra you're just like what the fuck is happening but it would also be kind of awesome to watch too at the same time yeah, I mean, it, it kind of sounds like the uh, the like going to see the Spider Man musical. Uh, I didn't know there was such a thing. Yeah, so there was there was a musical. I forgot what year it came out. Uh, it was in the like between, I want to say, I want to say twenty sixteen. Let's, let's say that or twenty fifteen. Um, and the musical was riddled with so many. Uh, uh, technical problems because Spider-Man's supposed to do all this crazy shit that I think a bunch of people got super injured and a person almost died and even in rehearsal I think like actors would get injured constantly and mm. basically it failed because uh, the uh, insurance and health bills ended, ended, ended up being way more expensive than, uh, than uh, you know, uh, admissions fee at this Broadway musical. So it was one of the shortest lived musicals. Interesting. I didn't hear about that. But, you know, until it, uh, a raven eats the eyeball of a guest, I, I'm going to assume uh, Dario has uh, the Spider-Man musical beat. <laughs> uh all right, well, let's get into the film a bit. Uh, so uh, the film, uh, Dario Argento working with definitely a bigger budget, uh, I think, than he would, uh, definitely on the larger side, uh, working in Europe, $8 million, 1987, so pretty good sized at the time. Um, I think this film looks fantastic. I love the way this looks. I feel like compared to um, other Argento films even, there's a bigness and an expansiveness to the way that the movie looks that is still impressive for a director that is known for really, really impressive visuals. Uh, did you have any thoughts on kind of like the uh, set design, the the kind of technical uh, visuals to the film? Uh, no, I, I, uh, I mean, I echo that the, the visual and set designs were just really great. Uh, also, great use of transitions. I mean, I think this is one of the films where it flows from one scene to another many times almost seamlessly or even the transition itself makes it even bigger i mean one of the notes i have is when uh, you first meet betty you're in her room and then after she leaves and uh, the transition from her room to the play or the opera it basically is going from the room into the <clears throat> into the event out of the event of the opera and you get to see the entire actual stage course that's not something that he did right the opera house is the beautiful opera house in Parma but just how that was seamlessly and then you really get to enjoy the uh, how grandiose the opera is so with the camera basically the camera movement the editing on uh, all of that really amplifies and, get, and uh, amplifies the experience Right, right. I mean, for me too, visually expressive in the sense that the camera seems to always be moving or panning or just doing all kinds of visual things that I think are really uh, uh, visually dynamic. Um, it was uh, filmed, Argento has used a variety of cinematographers throughout the career, so I'm inclined to give a lot of credit towards uh, Argento himself for giving kind of the films as a unique look uh, to, or at least uh, having, like, he clearly takes a certain degree of control over that. But it was lensed by Ronnie Taylor, who won an Oscar for uh, 
uh, a film called Gandhi, <laughs> which is not not exactly uh, the movie that I would think uh, Argento would pull someone from, but uh, interesting. Um, and doing some of the special effects work, uh, Sergio St- Stivalotti, who did a lot of uh, work with Argento kind of around the time. Um, and I think a lot of it is really well done. Even just like some of the interior designs, like Betty's apartment, I think looks fantastic. Mm-hmm. We see her with like her sound system and there's like all kinds of books and stuff. And I just love it. And even uh, her boyfriend, I forget what the boyfriend's name is before he's killed. It's like, it's almost, they, they, I think Betty calls his place almost a museum. And it's like, even just like the basic living places of these very young people, uh, it might be a little, a tad unrealistic, but, uh, it, it, they are very impressive uh, to look at, and well, I, I love that as far as the setting goes. Yeah, well the, well, the boyfriend explains why he lives in that mansion, and it was because that's his uh, uncle's house. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I, th- and uh, you would assume the same for Betty, too, her mom being um, a famous opera person as well. Uh, mm-hmm. Probably uh, she inherited some money or something like that. Um, so I, I guess that's the reason, uh, which, which I guess... Fair enough. I, that makes sense. I mean, a, um, but her house is not that impressive. I mean, she, I wouldn't say that Betty is living in anything extraordinary. She's living in an, in an upper in an upper class apartment. Yeah, but she's supposed to be seventeen. So I mean, for someone that's that young, uh, right? So yeah, that that yeah. that's where the whole uh, wealthy mom comes in. But I mean, but what I'm trying to say is that one did not strike me as huge, as opposed okay, to sure, sure. as opposed to the boyfriend's house. That was it, it was like a museum. I'm pretty sure they shot that scene in a museum. <laughs> <laughs> they, they just go into a museum, put a bed down there, and like, all right, this is your your home now. Uh, yeah. Okay. Well, I love uh, a lot of it. You kind of remarked earlier on the opera house, and it is a fantastic set. I love a lot of the shots just at the very beginning where we see a lot of just the people behind the scenes. Like the film actually does a good job of just showing you like kind of the chaos and the complicated nature Mm -hmm. of putting on a show like this where we see all the crew and stuff shouting cues, counting, things like that. And I love the way that that is orchestrated uh, in the film and even the way just it opens and we have kind of the point of view of the actress that is originally supposed to play Lady Macbeth and we see have like the point of view of her like throwing a fit and walking away before she gets hit by a car. Mm -hmm. Um, I think it's just uh, incredibly uh, visually well done. Yeah, no, for sure. I mean, uh, in the chaos part, I I literally have in my notes, beautiful chaos in backstage. (laughs) There you go, yeah. Yeah, I mean, even, like, the opening shots uh, of, like, the crow and, like, the reflection of it, mm-hmm. uh, those those are, like, something that I feel like Argento is, like, one of a few people that is going to uh, try to actually get real shots like that uh, on camera. Yeah, no, for sure. Um, it's funny how we, we, we say crow or ravens, because, I, I, to be honest, I, I don't even know... I, like the movie says raven but they seem kind of small yeah, yeah. so i was it, like it, they're supposed to be ravens yeah <laughs> I, I think they are ravens um <laughs> i was listening to another podcast before this and that was a topic of, of conversation and if they are correct they decided they were ravens so okay uh, i mean i i did stop the movie for a second to watch a youtube video doing a comparison between crows and ravens because <laughs> 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 i was like this is bothering me because they, they really remind me of Seattle crows. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. They, they look a lot like what I'm used to seeing too. I mean, so were, what was your conclusion? Did you think they were crows or ravens? Um, I don't know. <laughs> I, even now, I don't know because, um, so the, 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 and this is a full tangent that, you know, maybe we can skip in the editing, but, uh, <laughs> Uh, like the the crows have more of a growl kind of sound, while the ravens are more like a, a rap, like growl, growl. And in that sense, you know, the movie had a craven sound, uh, a raven sound. I mean, <laughs> craven, a, craven. <laughs> a raven sound. However, uh-huh. um, that can be done in post. Yeah, and, I mean, and these these are all dubbed voices too, so undoubtedly those sounds are in post too yeah okay so so then as behavior goes uh, ravens tend to be much more calm than crows so like crows 
don't stay, stay still like they sort of bounce around and they move their tail a lot while they're mm -hmm. like standing uh us cravens are more you know calm so i mean i don't know and then cravens are significantly bigger than crows uh, crows are the size of you know uh, uh, pigeons and cravens are the sun the, the size of, of hawks mm. uh but i uh, again uh, i mean these are all small things I, at the end of the day, was unsure if they were ravens or crows. So maybe, uh, maybe we can just say they're ravens. Like some, since the movie, that's what the movie tells us. So we'll take them okay. at the word. Yeah, I, I would take them at the word. Okay, fair enough. All right, we'll go with ravens. Uh, yeah, so what, what else about this film did you like? Um, I have a couple things jotted down, but wanted to toss it to you to see if there were any things that really stood out to you as being uh, highlights about the film. Um, so I liked the, uh, some of the sound effects, uh, on the killing, especially when they're killings off screen mm. or somewhat off screen, uh, which we see a couple. Um, so I, I like that, uh, generally speaking, uh, the, all the scenes in the vent, uh, I mean, yeah. there's the single, you know, the single track, the tracking shots and events. Uh, are yeah, there, we'll, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll break that one down later on. I think that is a fantastic se sequence. I mean, that, that was quite, I was just kind of watching that without sound before we started recording and it's quite a long sequence. Um, but yeah, that one's uh, definitely worth discussing at least. Um, in terms of sound design and sort of like the sounds that happen, I also noted that too. And I was curious if you thought that these were, this is like a new evolution from Argento or if this is something he did before. I was not totally sure. I didn't remember sounds sounding exactly, kind of having that same sort of like squishy sound uh, that they do in this, uh, in like his previous films, but I could be mistaken. I think this is new. Uh, okay. And partly it is because I think this movie actually uh, had less uh, gore on the screen. This, uh, in comparison to other Argento films that we've watched, uh, this one, most of the killing is done off screen, uh, and, you, and all you're seeing is Betty watching him kill his victims. Mm. Uh, that's the focus. The focus is her not trying to, to, to close her eyes. And I mean, like, sure, you have like small cuts, uh, uh, cuts of scene where you see a little bit of gore, but not much. And in comparison to previous films, uh, where it's it's all about the gore, here it's very little gore. And to compensate for that, I think Argento used uh, the, the sound design. Yeah, yeah, you might be right about that. I mean, other than the crow eating the eyeball, which you know. It's just a fantastic thing that I really enjoyed. I mean, um, yeah, if you're, if you're, <laughs> since, since you're asking me, you know, a list of things that I, I loved is the fucking crow scene at, at the at the final play. I mean, or Raven. <laughs> I mean, yeah, yeah. I mean, to me, too, it's like, I don't know if I like this film as much as the very best Argentos in my view. But it certainly has some of his absolute best sequences. I love that uh, Raven sequence where <laughs> it's just it's just totally batshit uh, in in like the best possible way. Um. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I I uh, it got an audible reaction out of me when uh, all of that was happening. I knew <laughs> as soon as the ravens were out flying, I knew that they were going to ruin the, the killer shit, and uh, <laughs> and I was just like, "What? This is happening." Like, I thought something would happen, but I didn't think it was going to be that way. And uh, that's probably the, the one scene where, you know, the metal music was completely justified. Uh-huh. Uh, again, I agree with you that there's some uh, poor use of metal. But if there's one scene where metal was justified, it was that one. Yeah, absolutely. Um you know, I don't think I think the metal is used slightly better here than it is in Phenomena. Oh, they didn't really play did. it over <laughs> Donald Pleasance's funeral in this one. Um, and I also knew it was coming, but the first time I heard metal uh, in the song, which is like uh, I think it's when uh, her boyfriend's getting killed. Yeah, I just started laughing uh, the first time I had seen this film, but I knew it was coming this time, so I prepared myself. But it, to me, I I think it does kind of take me a little bit out of it the fact that he uses metal. But I do agree for the the Raven scene where they're circling and the camera swirling and stuff and you're just like oh what the fuck this is just madman argento at his best uh the the metal 
it works. I mean, it works well enough. Would I have chosen it? Probably not, but it works. I don't even know what, what I would have chosen if not metal, though. Like, I, <laughs> I, I, I also think it's consistent. Like, I, I agree with you. The, the, the first kill, they use metal. On, mm-hmm. um, it does take you a little bit out of the movie. But then its consistent use of metal during the kills makes it to the point where the, when the, crow, the, the, the ravens are, fr- are flying, that metal is... You're like, yeah, yeah, this is good. It, you're you're kind of used to it at that point, I guess. You're used to it, and it works really well on that scene after setting it up already. Um, and But yeah, no, there, even here, though, there, there was a moment where she is running away on a crowded uh, street, and there was metal pre- playing, and it made no sense there. Yeah, yeah. It, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, the bird scene is is just uh, an awesome one. Sadly, I think the film goes a little bit downhill after that scene. But you know, uh, the the birds eating the eye is is an absolute highlight for me. I mean, he had um, to explain the plot, didn't he? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, well, very good. Um, yeah, the sound design I, I also caught my eye. I had that in my notes too, and it was one of those curious things where I was curious to hear your point of view on it. And I think we both agree tentatively that it does have kind of like this new addition to it. And I think what you made a good point there uh, in just terms of like showing the kills, how we see a little bit less than you may have seen in the past. And he compensates for it with sound design. Um, but yeah, it, it felt like um, just something a little bit different uh, in Argento's work. And I, I liked it. I liked the way that the sound design is a little more exaggerated and stylized and squishy at points. Mm-hmm. Um. Yeah, uh, let's see. Uh, anything else uh, you really enjoyed? Um, otherwise, we can k- get into kind of some of the k- the de- the designs of the killer and a few of the the um, uh, scenes. Perhaps not enjoy, uh, but uh, that caught my attention. I think this is p- perhaps one of the more most comedic of uh, Argento's film that we watched. Um, whether this is uh, on purpose, it's different, but I think it is. Uh, I think so. Back to the use of metal, like metal takes away a lot of the the, the tension that the killing scenes have, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, and I think that that's done for a purpose. Is because here it's a more. This is supposed to be more of a roller coaster than a film. Uh, using uh, Scorsese's uh, statement, <laughs> but uh, this is more about fun than about you know like taking this serious. So you you have the metal music being played in the in the in the scenes that you know you're, you're butchering someone. Uh, uh, other elements are, for example, the the side character, the uh, dress, the dresser, or whatever her name was. Uh, she is directed in a way that uh, her character is somewhat comedic like she she makes funny faces to the camera as she's looking for you know the uh the magnifier she is sort of she just acts funny uh she even has like a pretty silly fight with the killer where they are throwing at each other you know fucking iron and even when she like realizes who she is, she's like, oh, like I don't know. It just feels like very lighthearted. Very, uh, she almost seems like one of the, uh, like, I don't know. It, it just feels very lighthearted. So to me, this is this is filmed or intended to be a lighthearted movie. Interesting. I don't. I don't know if I totally agree with that, um, but. Huh, I'm curious to hear a little more. Were there other characters you found to be kind of comedic too? Um, I understand what you're saying about her. She kind of is always like like making snide faces or like snide remarks, especially about Marco, the director, who she doesn't seem to care for at all. Yeah. Um, uh, I mean, any other comments, any other views? Uh, I, I guess like... I don't know. I mean, there, there's, there are certain moments where I'm not sure if it's comedy or not like or lighthearted or not like for example the little girl that uh saves the main character 
you know, why is there a little girl? Why does she save her? She is a character that is uh, important enough, uh, and and you know, we then after she's the the Betty leaves, you hear the mom beating the little girl. Weird. And then the next scene that we see the little girl is her bringing her abusive mom to the play. Weird. Um, I don't know if that's a light-hearted thing, and and I mean, but it's light-hearted that it has a little girl now. A little girl having abusive mom. Not sure. <laughs> You're not sure if that's light-hearted or not. I, I, don't, I don't think so. Pretty unlight-hearted. <laughs> well, it's unlight-hearted, but the, the movie almost takes it as a light-hearted. Like the girl when when she's like, "Why are you on the bent?" Oh, it's that uh, you know, it's my 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 parents are fighting. Oh. Oh, they 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 uh, hurt each other. Yeah, uh, that happens. And it's just like it is very like passe. Like it's off the cuff. Yeah, my parents are beating each other. They're probably gonna beat me at some moment. Eh, that's why I get on the vents. It, <laughs> I, I think that might just be your Chilean sense of humor here. <laughs> um, to me, at least, uh, I I, I kind of chalk that up as unintentionally funny, which I kind of get too. Uh, I mean, like there are points where I have laughed at this film where you're probably not supposed to. Uh, like when the heavy metal music first plays, I'm always just like, I kind of get a stupid grin on my face. Uh, and it is kind of fun at the same time, but it's also pretty silly. Uh, <laughs> uh, and like the very last scene with her rolling in like the flowers and stuff, I can't help but laugh a little bit at that. Uh, mm -hmm. But oh yeah, I forgot uh, about that. Yeah, her rolling, her, her becoming a tree hugger, saving a, a fucking gecko or lizard. Lizard, yeah. Um, even the, the setting. I mean, I might be very wrong on this. I, I I could be entirely wrong, but when she's running away from the killer at the last scene, mm -hmm. on this rolly green hills with white mountains in the back and her that wearing works. a blue dress i could not for the love of god not think of um <clears throat> the sound of music <laughs> yeah no that's fair enough i mean very uh similar and here's the thing i, I think i truly think that argento like he wanted to make uh, that's what I'm talking I'm, I guess I'm not saying when I'm saying light I, I don't mean light as in like like uh, it's just a, a thoughtless movie like it's like an Avengers film uh, it, it's a thoughtless movie that you know you watch for entertainment and no more and I think that's what Argento filmed here and that that was his purpose and to that purpose he did a great job uh, and especially at the ending, uh, which I read on Wikipedia, apparently uh, uh, the distributors in the U.S. did not want it to have that ending because they thought it was stupid. And he's like, "It got no, it, it has to be there. It, it, that epilogue has to be there." <laughs> well, to be honest, uh, as much as I love Argento, I kind of agree with the U.S. producers that it is kind of stupid. <laughs> So um, that's my point of view here. Um, interesting. Uh, yeah, I don't think I totally share your perspective on that. Uh, I, I don't know that I find this to be as much uh, popcorn-y, at least no more so than other Argento films necessarily. Mm. Um, to me, at least, uh, I think Argento, with part partial success here, uh, I think now is probably a good time to talk about Betty and the characters here, mm -hmm. which I think Argento is doing some somewhat interesting work here, uh, kind of relating it back to her mother and kind of that relationship there. I think on one hand, um, Betty is one of the stronger characters Argento has written, certainly one of the strongest female characters he's written, uh, as far as like that goes. Um, and also with a fairly interesting kind of like killer motivation to it in the sense that he had like a relationship with her mother. Uh, so I don't know. Uh, I, I guess kick it to you. Uh, see what you thought of Betty. I thought the performance was quite good. Um, just portraying kind of that uh, complexity there. Um, and the kind of seeing 
her characterization a second time and stuff and putting it together with the actual giallo mystery aspects of it i think a little bit more of it gels together for me uh the second time viewing it uh when i saw it the first time a couple of years ago um but uh yeah i don't know <laughs> sorry that's a bit muddled but uh just any thoughts on betty i mean i, I think uh, i agree with you that uh betty probably has uh it's one of the characters with mo the most agency of the Argento films we've watched Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, now that I'm thinking about like how many Argento films have uh, the female character as the main character? Uh, we got Sus- Phenomena, Phenomena, uh, Suspiria, uh, but um, Infernal, kind of, but no, kind of not too. Uh, uh, Phenomena, Suspiria, and this one, I think, is the ones that I can think first right. come to mind. Um, the Phenomena, uh, the girl has superpowers yet. She's a damsel in distress. Suspiria, the girl, is nothing. <laughs> I'm sorry. Like, it's just bland. I mean, the, it's true for a lot of Argento characters. Is he's not he's not a great writer. Sure. He, he he excels at visual styles. I don't think Argento is particularly bad towards women, personally. No, no, I don't think but, so. Uh, but, uh, yeah, I mean, it's one of the more... He is actually going for a somewhat in-depth characterization with Betty, mm-hmm. I feel like, more so than he normally does. Right, and, and, I, and I agree with that, uh, that Betty in this one uh, does things. Uh, and I mean, not just her, like other characters. Uh, the, again, the, the dress, the dress make, maker or whatever, she literally uh, almost got the bad guy. Like she straight up like hit him with an uh, iron and I think on the head and he was knocked out for a little bit and had she not wanted to look at his ma- face had she just killed him instead of look at his fa- tried to look at his face I think she, uh, the movie would have would have ended there uh, so that character had a lot of agency even though she was short lived Betty um, also Betty and her manager in the scene where they are in in her apartment. Uh, not knowing who the fuck was the killer and who was the cop um, also was in a situation where um, like they they grabbed the knife they kind of had a plan um, and the killer tricked them and I, I in a way this the killer is a sm- much smarter character too it's not just Betty but here the killer is a much more smarter character Mm-hmm. Um, but I mean, but at the same time, I don't know. That Betty also has some idiot moments. She knows she's going to be killed, yet she lets someone in, in when she cannot see because she has eye drops in her eyes, uh, <laughs> and that causes the whole situation of whether or not uh, uh, they have Daniel, whatever his name is, in the house or the killer. Yeah, at the same point, that what she does there is fairly understandable. It's far from the least boneheaded decision that we've seen in a horror movie. No, especially someone who's forced not to blink. Um, right, right. No, I mean, that, that's the only moment where I was like, okay, this is idiotic. Right. Uh, supposedly, Argento was, uh, like, kind of responding to the AIDS era. Uh, this film came out in 1987, so kind of... I'm not sure if that is exactly the hype, but in that certainly in that era, um, and so he was like focusing a lot on kind of like the coldness uh, between people, where Betty is made to be more frigid, um, and like the mom's past and stuff like that is obviously the killer who is the cop. Um, uh, so that so that that supposedly or or the director who is called by one character at one point to be a sadist. Mm-hmm. So uh, kind of. Uh, showing uh sort of like distance in people's um i don't know not sure exactly how to describe that but sort of different orientations and stuff like that uh within people Hmm. i I didn't see that more in this one than in other movies (laughs) yeah i mean i feel like it's not particularly well done as far as the theme goes but it's done uh and it kind of works uh as far as like our argento theme goes personally for me i like this film as you described it like a popcorn film uh where i enjoy like a lot of the sets and just the way it's designed and stuff and for me this is uh more just like a very enjoyable film because it has some just fantastic designs and stuff like that and it's not a film that 
I feel like the deeper themes necessarily work. I do feel like Argento is trying for something there uh, in terms of the character work and in terms of some of the thematics there. I mean, don't, don't get me wrong. Uh, by the way, I, the, this whole like roller coaster or uh, theme park or whatever versus, you know, like a, a weighty, deeper film. I'm, I'm using like Scorsese's sort of comparison when he was talking about, you know, uh, Marvel films. And the reason I put this closer on the Marvel side is, I mean, you know, Black Panther talks, addresses a whole bunch of issues that are very weighty, but it's a popcorn film. Okay, yeah, fair enough, fair enough. I mean, would you not put most Argentos into that sort of category, though? I guess I would. I would put all of them as popcorn. <laughs> like, are there any ones that you would remove and say this one uh, kind of uh, ascends from that? Well, because of the, uh, it, it would, I mean, due to its just heavy style, stylistic manner and just com complete lack of care for, uh, for plot development, uh, probably the uh, Suspiria and its uh, sequel, I might take it out of that because it's just so weird. Interesting. Um, for me, almost I would put those even more in popcorn just because there's so little you have to pay attention to in terms of plot. You just kind of let it wash over you. But, you know, those films are, I guess you enjoy them a little bit less than like <laughs> Avengers films, or at least in a very different fashion, I would say. Well, it, it, um, so to me, Suspiria and, and the other one are films that you have to be looking at the screen the entire time to enjoy. Hmm. If, you, if, you, if you miss something, you, you, you're missing part of the actual appeal of the film, which is that visual concept. With a movie like Avengers, you could listen to the movie, miss some stuff, and sure, you're going to miss some action at some moment. But the plot is being driven by the dialogue. Mm. Here, your, your plot is dri being driven, driven by a dialogue. I mean, if you look away, yes, you're going to miss some amazing shots of a good director. Which again, the Avengers also get there. They get a bunch of good directors to direct their movies. I mean, Taika Waititi, for example. But you can get the gist of it without missing much uh, if, if you look away. Because the beauty of those films is the direction of the actors, the dialogue, the direction of how they, that should be played and all that stuff as well. Okay, I kind of get what you're saying. So you're saying that like Inferno and Suspiria are almost completely driven by the visuals um, and uh, uh, Avengers and maybe some of Argento's Giallo are less so. Right, and it, it almost forces you to watch those. To, to, it, you're forced to watch them if you want to understand them. Okay, sure, sure, gotcha. Um, yeah, I mean, I I, I can't couldn't fathom. Uh, I mean, I feel like Argento's the appeal of his films uh, mainly is in the visuals of it too, and the way he constructs scenes and and that stuff. So uh, I do think it would be a shame to turn away. But I I think I understand your point now. Um, okay, uh, so let's see. Uh, let's uh, get into uh, some of this. Anything you else want, you wanted to talk about as far as Betty and kind of the killer motivations there with her like family history? Well, just like any Argento film, the motivations is probably the least important or the least interesting aspect of it. I mean, he tries to do more here. Uh, I, I do feel like he tries harder than he maybe has in any of his films. Uh, I don't know that it works. I don't think it really works. It, most of my complaints with this film come in like the last 25 minutes of it. Uh, but uh, but I do think he is trying. Uh, I, I So the, uh, this is one of those movies where I, the less I know, perhaps the better. You know, the killer's a fucking psychopath. Good enough. But, uh, you know, oh, the killer is doing it because when he was young, he would kill for her mother because her mother was a sadist. I would love watching him kill people. But then he had to kill yeah, her I, because it went too far. I mean, at least that relates to the MO. I'll say, okay, having watched this a second time, for me, I almost always view it the same as you in the sense that, like, who cares? I, I just don't care about the motivations. Like, just make this part go as fast as possible. Who, who gives a shit? For me, 
actually this film worked slightly better. I'm not going to say it really worked great, but it worked a little bit better just in the sense that it does make sense in, in the sense that he is doing something a little bit different than they do in other giallos. He's actually capturing her and making her watch. Uh, which actually does make a little bit more sense given his motivation. So okay. I do think there's just uh, just like one or two levels. It, it's like 20% better than the other All right. Argento movies. I, I agree. I agree. Uh, there, there is an actual connection on what's happening, on the motive of why it's happening, as opposed to you know him having a triple Y chromosome. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, or or it's like uh, even the just the killer in Tenebrae, which is probably m maybe my favorite Argento Giallo. It's like, yeah, it's just something it, a girl made fun of him when he was younger, <laughs> and so now he's he just basically went batshit. Uh, so it's like, yeah, whatever, who cares? <laughs> For there, it's more like who did it rather than why is more interesting. What was the motive uh, on the movie uh, where the where the monkey goes ape shit? <laughs> Uh, like, she had a kid, and the kid was messed up somehow. Oh, that was it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, like, those are those are pretty whatever. You can toss those out. I mean, like, they're so bad that's like I've seen these films multiple times, and I can barely remember them. Uh, <laughs> I, I guess they turn off my brain as soon as I, they start talking. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, you're kind of trained to because it's like it doesn't matter. It's like it, the appeal of these films is so rarely uh, the actual motive that it's like it's, it's the motive is just an excuse to have all the fun stuff that happens before. Mm -hmm. um, okay, well, uh, let's get on to uh, some of the uh, okay. Well, well, real first, let's talk because we're on it on the killer design, and you know, in the posters of this film or kind of the thumbnails you're going to see when you see it you're going to see that image of betty with her eyes with like the needles taped to them mm -hmm. how did you like that visually is uh striking uh practically speaking is stupid <laughs> like I, I i was thinking about how how they they were on on the face so this is my inner nathaniel right so I was thinking uh -huh. how the, the, the needles are pointing upwards and the entire time, unless you are like, whenever you wink, you like crunch your entire face or you like, you know, you wrinkled your entire face, unless that's how you blink. A normal human being blinks by just allowing their, uh, you know, uh, upper eyelids move down and nothing else. So unless you were like blinking and really hard making your entire face move, the whole thing doesn't work. Because the whole thing requires her cheeks to go up in order to get her eyes tapped. And most people don't blink like that. So, but ignoring the Nathaniel part, it looks really cool. Yeah, no, I think it looks awesome. I think it's a great idea. Uh, of course, if you overthink it like that, then maybe it doesn't work quite so well but it's a great image of just seeing like the eye being held open like that supposedly argento was motivated uh by like watching people watch his films and like them like covering their eyes and stuff like that so he is the person that likes to torture the audience by putting needles there and making him do it but it's like just a great conception that just makes you like that extra 30 percent squeamish just watching the murders happen just seeing betty there and i love the way that she's kind of like tied to uh kind of a pillar uh in the first kill and then in the second kill where she's in kind of like that costume designer's place she's like put in like the mannequin place and they're just like some of uh i think the strongest visuals uh that argento has come up with and he is uh visually i think uh visionary in a lot of ways yeah no i agree and, and i think uh, when we talk about squeamishness uh the first time you see him putting the, uh, the the needle contraption on her eyes or uh, like on her cheeks technically you don't you don't know what he was gonna do the killer so you assume that he's gonna stab her eyes uh, at that point you know it is terrifying and you will get very squeamish but uh, again it, it looks cool functionally it doesn't work that well you know it would have worked a lot better if you had uh, the uh, 
uh, Clockwork Orange, you know, I mm. probably... Wait, so what What would have happened then with, like, if nothing. you actually taped it? So, nothing, okay. Nothing, because the needles are already, are already outside your eye. Uh, like, the needles are in front of her eyes already. They're not in her uh -huh. eyes. When you blink, your eyelids just go down, and your eyelids are very attached to your eyes. So at worst, it would... It might stab part of your eyelids at the worst. You know what I'm saying? Like, okay, sure, sure, sure. Okay, I'm gonna try not to think about this so as I don't ruin the movie <laughs> for me again. Um, but I do like uh, how he puts like a little bit of blood on them too. So it seems like they are kind of painful. It looks very painful when you you see it. Yeah, no, and it looks like she stabbed herself a couple times. Like that's. Mm -hmm. But. The blood also almost indicates that she's stabbing the top of her eyes, uh, the top of her, like... Anyways, I know yeah. I'm overthinking it. Uh, it's because I, I think this is a cool design, but at the same time, its functionality was questionable. All right, Nathaniel, you can go back to Anacortes now. Uh, okay, uh, so uh, let's see. In terms of sets, I have a couple of them picked out. Uh, for me, at least the highlights were the birds, which we've kind of touched on already. Mm -hmm thought that was one of the great ones and then the ones where uh the there we have like the detectives uh coming in and we're not sure which one is like on the right side and that whole sequence were there any other sets uh sequences that you had highlighted in, in your notes uh and i also have the conclusion highlighted for bad reasons all right um yeah i i have uh I have those two, and of course the uh, I guess the, that comes with it. The, is it the right detective or not? Scene. Um, they're walking on the vents with a little girl. Yes, yes, which is all in the same sequence. Yeah, or at least I put it on to the same sequence. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, let's talk about that because we haven't touched on that at all. Um, so yeah, I I love the way the sequence is just set up, where we basically have it. So Daria Nicolodi, who is playing. Uh, kind of her agent, I guess, um, assistant agent. Uh, she comes there and she's basically uh, kind of there for support. And then they realize at a certain point that there are two detectives that are saying that they are Danielle Suave uh, or Daniel Suave. And so they realize that one of them is probably the killer and they're not sure to trust the one that's in the apartment or the one that's downstairs. And so... Uh, it's just, uh, it, at what, some point the lights get cut and then there's like, it do, just does a really good job of being very, very patient where she's got to get the phone at one point. So she's trying to like hook the phone over cause it's kind of like in this dark room and somehow, uh, Daniel Suave, the, at least the detective that is in her apartment disappears at one point. So we just don't know where he is. So there's like this great sense of danger where it's like, is he in the apartment? Is he outside of the apartment? Um, and then it we kind of get some nice colored lighting there get just a little bit of that suspiria red green light going on mm -hmm. um and then we have um uh this great sequence where she's trying to call and we get the gun to the eye hole um which i think is one of uh, argento's great kills definitely one of the most notable ones here uh what did you think of this sequence up to the, that point it's beautiful i mean um it, it's it's really well done uh, the suspense in it is is, is you know it, it, it's great uh, my well, I guess the area where I, I thought it was kind of fun too is how her agent is like both her agent and, and uh, Betty have big as knives to defend themselves uh, yet they don't use them um, I also like how uh, I, I was surprised that uh, you know you would see a killer using a gun. I think this is the uh, first Argento film where you actually see a gun being used. Right, right. I mean, it's usually very. I mean, I, I think Argento usually likes to kill people in much greater style than that. Uh, but he came up with a very creative use to make uh, the gun death very effective. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I, I think it's if there was going to be a, a use of a gun and a kill with a gun. This is probably the, only, the the way that Argento, the only way that Argento knows how to do it, straight into the eye, through a peephole. 
Yeah. I mean, it was really effective. I mean, you can kind of see it coming if you really think about it. Uh, but it's like the way that they draw it out and he's like, uh, here's my badge or here's my gun and stuff like that until finally uh, she gets it. And then one thing I noticed this time too is the phone goes through her head and kills a Darren Nickelodeon. And then it also shoots the phone too. Hmm. So she's like double, double screwed over uh, by, by the shot. Um, and then the sequence just keeps going. Um, and at one point, like a pillow creates this great image where it's like broken and falls onto the ground. And then she gets bailed out in a very Argento moment because it comes out of nowhere. And y if you are used to Dario Argento's work, you're, you kind of forgive it, but it's kind of like a, what the fuck just happened? Where a little girl comes out of the vent and tells her that she's constantly watching her and lis watching her, op uh, her sing and says that she has a beautiful voice and she basically bails her out by going into the vents and they crawl away. But the sequence is not totally over because she still gets swallowed there, still draws it out very nicely before she goes into um, the little girl's apartment. Uh, we know the killer is following her into the vents, but they do manage to escape uh, that way. Mm -hmm. So, uh, yeah, uh, I know you had the vents highlighted. Uh, so going to toss it to you. Any thoughts? Well, it's just, it's a really, I mean, the, the vent design is just very, it's both grimy, but clean. It's kind of, uh, it's, it's kind of pretty because it's an old building. On how it's a single tracking, that, that single tracking shot of uh, of them just walking through it, uh, with both the suspense, but also the little girl explaining how you know she gets beat by her parents. Uh, all of it just makes it so off-putting that uh, it really attracted me. Yeah, yeah. Did you like how the little girl's uh, apartment is like totally green? It's like teal. Or yeah. I'm not even sure what shade. Yeah. It, it, well, it adds to the lighting, though. It certainly does. I'm sure that was the only reason for it, too. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I, I just like that, uh, that last ending sequence. What's interesting about the little girl is that uh, technically, on uh, Argento's defense, you hear her once in a while beforehand. Yes. Uh, it hints at it. Uh, yeah, there, there is a, a scene where I think Betty is sleeping or falling asleep and you hear the girl saying, you did a great job. And you're like, oh, fuck, is this one of those Argento movies with ghosts or shit? <laughs> and it's like, oh, no, no, it's, it's, it's a weird little weirdo who crawls through vents. Yeah. Do you think like three months after the events of Hopper take place, Betty is at home like practicing and like... She's like, what the fuck? Is this girl watching me still? <laughs> maybe, or maybe uh, Betty will uh, would, uh, you know, try to adopt the little girl. Because, I mean, the mom seems, seems pretty uh, shitty. Fair, fair, fair. These questions are all left unanswered. I mean, yeah, it, it's like you did a good job. You pointed out the other points where it does hint at her. And then we see her going to Betty's show at the end. Um, supposedly, there was a fair amount of material in the script originally that did not make it into this because they ran out of money for the budget. So I do wonder if there's a little bit more there in the story that is just kind of cut out. It feels very incomplete, even for Argento mm. um, in that sense. Um, but, you know, Argento has a lot of weirdisms in his uh, work that, so it's not out of character for him to just take this thread and just drop it randomly. Yeah, I mean, I mean, if you wanna, if you wanna make it like, a more Argento weirdism, it would be if the little girl were to do, be doing the entire exposition of what's happening while they were walking through the vents. It's like, why does this little girl know? I don't know. But you know what I'm saying? Like, like I don't know. I, I go back to Suspiria because it's my first Argento film, and I just still remember when uh, that professor like completely explains the movie to you because the Argento yeah. couldn't. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and it's like not even at the end. It's just like 10 minutes randomly in the middle that's lit totally differently than the other film. It's like totally the part where it's like, okay, it's time for a water break. Uh, all right, come back once they get back to the school. So that's what I'm saying. Like, hey, if Argento wanted to really make it that off-putting, have the little girl explain the entire plot to you right after the events in that green room for no reason. Yeah, it's like, oh, your mom. Yeah, I was watching her when I was four years old. <laughs> Here, here's why. Here's what's going on. Yeah. She can be in little girl exposition. 
uh, that would be a fairly Argento move to it. Um, uh, okay. Uh, in terms of the bird sequence, anything else you wanted to add from what we were talking about earlier? Yeah, the, ca- the camera use. Uh, you know, I mean, I, I'm actually kind of curious how they did that because uh, you have the, bir- the bird's eye view flying all around and circling and flying all around inside the uh, opera. And we're talking about like really high up. Uh, this is, I mean, this is the late 80s. So maybe they had like mini helicopters flying around, uh, or I guess drones, uh, 80s, uh-huh. 80s drones, which probably were extremely expensive. Perhaps that's where the budget went. Um, but that was, I mean, I, I'm, I'm pretty sure even though expensive, that was probably one of the most enjoyable shots, just flying with this bird all around the fucking stage uh, where the people are sitting and all that, uh, going up and down. I wonder how many drones they broke for the, uh, to do that. Um <laughs> Yeah, and supposedly the ravens uh, that were used on it were really difficult to work with, which they knew ahead of time, but Argento wanted to do it anyway, so they spent a ton of money on them, and like when they released them like that, they released something like 140, and they spent like all day just trying to recapture them, and they could only get like 60 of them back, so they like only get like a couple shots at these things too. Yeah, I mean, whether it's a crow or raven, those are um, some of the smartest fucking birds in the world uh, they know how to use tools and all that stuff they remember they have really good memory all that and you know what smart animals are terrible at acting they're above it it's not like a fucking dog and I mean dogs <laughs> are also like apparently uh, from what I've read uh, it's really hard to shoot dogs I can only imagine shooting a fucking bird that remembers you and even gets a, a what's it called uh, can get angry at you and not forget <laughs> mm-hmm, mm-hmm. yeah but yeah no i agree i mean technically this film is a marvel and i think a lot of the shots that are gentle planned look fantastic and the bird's eye view and like the swirling cameras and stuff like that i mean they're fantastic mm-hmm. I guess another scene where uh, to me was comedic, but perhaps I am just messed up, is when the birds were attacking uh, the killer. And, uh, you okay? Yeah. Are you about to get killed? You just uh, t- turned your head like you're that, was, that someone's coming after you. There's a light, there was light, loud uh, thump. That's all. Uh, oh. When uh, uh, the birds were uh, attacking the guy, eating his eye and all that. He like pulls out his gun and he shoots, starts shooting randomly, and one of the extras on the opera gets shot. <laughs> 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 I mean, I'm sorry. Are we yeah. sure that I this mean, is not supposed to be funny? Yeah. I mean, honestly, the Raven sequence, as soon as they come blasting through there, how how can you not have a smile on your face? I mean Right, and then you add a random extra getting shot. <laughs> yeah. I know. What does the detective think he's doing? Um, there was one thing I actually forgot to uh, uh, circle back to. So, you know, uh, when the detective uh, is saying, like, okay, it's going to be Daniel Suave that comes over here, he's basically picking which detective is going to die. Do you think Daniel Suave is his uh, frenemy? Do you think it's, like, a guy on the forest he doesn't like? Who do you think Daniel Suave is? Uh, yeah, I guess so. It's like... <laughs> it's like you basically get to pick any of your coworkers to get knocked off. Yeah, it's like which one is the worst one? All right, Daniel yeah. Suave. <laughs> yeah, never like that guy. Or do you think he's just like picking someone random that he's never worked with before? Who knows? I think we're pr- probably putting more thought than Argento did. Definitely, definitely. But <laughs> yeah, I just wanted to bring that up. Okay, well, I feel like once the crows uh, actually attack the policemen, uh, we kind of go downhill from there, uh, where we start to get into parts where I kind of wish that the film just ended at that point and something happened to uh, 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 our detective. Um, so uh, once he's discovered, um, but we go into the room, um, there's a fire uh, at one point, and Betty manages to escape. 
he stages his own death death with a dummy, which is kind of one of those head scratching moments where I think Nathaniel would have an aneurysm if you ever saw this movie. Um, <laughs> and then uh, then we go to the Alps, which is kind of another fairly bizarre sequence uh, that is beautiful to look at, um, where Marco gets stabbed, uh, but Betty kind of has her own agency and manages to trick. Uh, detective and uh, and he gets caught. Um, yeah, any thoughts on post birds sequence? Um, I kind of wish she. Yeah, I I just these are the moments where you, you sort of wonder like okay motive. Okay, the, there's the background motive, but then like what does he want now the killer? This and he was you know directing her how to shoot him. And that sequence was itself the sequence where she's uh, blindfolded, holding a gun, following his directions. That part actually was sort of interesting. Uh, the camera movement on, on the gun, like uh, tracking the gun as he's saying left, left, no, right, no, left. Interesting. Uh, did not hate. Yeah, that. I agree. I agree. That that makes sense. Yeah, that that part was still it, the film hadn't fallen off the rails yet for me. There. I mean, it was like literally she shoots, and that's when it falls off the rail to you. <laughs> so, yeah. Um, after that, I mean, you, even even at that moment when uh, everything is burning, uh, and you have her try to figure out how to escape, um, I, I thought that was still interesting. Um, just you know, getting her, getting the key. Uh, first, getting the gun, shooting the door. Uh, the not enough bullets. Get the key. The key is kind of too hot, and it breaks on the doorknob. Uh, all of that. It's it's very lovely uh, moments of suspense, and of course, she gets saved. And uh, yeah, had it ended there, I think uh, it would have ended in a. Had it ended in a, in a freeze frame, you know. Another fiery freeze frame. You know, classic Argento ending. Yeah, uh, I think we all would have been uh, fully satisfied. Uh, but then there's the epilogue that I'm assuming you want to talk about. <laughs> yeah, did you have as many issues with uh, it as me? I thought the dummy thing was just... I mean, I'm usually very forgiving as far as plot and plot holes go, but I just found it to be stu pretty stupid, if I'm being honest. I just love how they played it. Like they, 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 it's like, oh, and apparently it was a dummy. Like that, that's the news. Yeah. And then there's this flashback scene where it's sort of portraying him throwing the dummy in. And it's like, yeah, it's like, what? Like, <laughs> we don't need when, how? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, as I said, I'm pretty sure Nathaniel had an aneurysm and he's not recovering from that mo moment on. Um, but truth be told, I guess I didn't care. Like, I mean, it was one of those where it's like, what? How? Okay. <laughs> I guess. <laughs> yeah, it's like, whatever. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And then the Alps sequence, I think, is well filmed. But other than that, it's just so silly. It's like, they get the news, uh, uh, basically. And Marco just comes to the window. He's like, Betty, run! As if they know that the killer is there. I guess they do know somehow. I forget how it oh, is. Oh, he's, yeah. he's like, uh, or he's like... Uh, I don't know if it was his girlfriend or whatever, mm -hmm. but she's on the floor, I think, dead. That's how he figures oh, out. Okay. It's like, oh, <laughs> the killer is here. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, and for me, that's just like an extension of the dummy. And I do wonder if maybe Argento running out of budget here made him like truncate some stuff. But I think it's a pretty bad ending, in my view, at least. I, I mean, uh, all right. So if we ignore the dummy the switch between the person to the dummy that's burning and that magically disappeared. Um, or, you know, fuck it, he had uh, teleporting abilities. Whatever we want to say. Uh, I thought, it, I actually liked the fact that she was able to trick him and, and beat him. I, I thought that was kind of nicely done. Uh, and then, Yes, sure, the, the whole random cops all being there, even though why would they know that he's there? I mean, all of that makes no sense. I, I think it would have been really lovely if she tricked him, and as she's behind him, she just fucking kills him. 
Yeah. You know, it would have been nice if she tricked him in the scene at the opera house rather than having to go all the way to the Alps again or something like sure, that. Sure, but but uh, I, I'm not... Even... So I'm just trying to get out of the dummy too because uh, I think the dummy is so stupid. Okay. I, I'm, I'm looking past the dummy. My yeah. inner Nathaniel okay. is in, uh, capable of uh, staying quiet in my head. And past the dummy, uh, we have... Okay. Uh, a lovely scene where I think could have been much stronger if she had killed him. And then the cops arrive after that and they know he's the killer. So she says that she's self-defense and then, you know, she ha goes into her uh, tree hugging mode. Uh, and, you know, like, I think you do all of that. And personally, I think would be would have been a slightly better movie. I agree. It would have been better. Uh, yeah. I mean, it, it it takes a lot to get me to become an Nathaniel, and this movie almost makes me become a Nathaniel at the end. Um, so, I think it must be pretty bad. <laughs> uh, okay. Uh, all right. Any last words before we get on to conclusions of who won? Um, I'm just looking... Uh, one line that I did find to be funny uh, was uh, when they were briefly talking about uh, Betty's frigidness. Uh, the director is like, oh, I always uh, jerk off before I film a, uh, a horror scene or something like that. Oh, I was going to talk about that, too. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah I guess... <laughs> you, you're going to be like, oh, that's how I prepare for the podcast. <laughs> <laughs> well, so the director was basically calling her a whore because uh, I think she's an alto or soprano. And he was saying, oh, all sopranos. He was like, trouble in love. And she's like, love? What do you, why do men always think that... Uh, but women have a problem it's about love and um, and then he says something and she's like uh, oh you think that all the sopranos are whores that's a myth you know it's a myth that uh sopranos have sex before uh before uh singing an opera and you're like what <laughs> and then it's just like <laughs> and also i mean you're a filmmaker filmmakers are also known for the sex thing and it's like well yeah i jerk off before all uh, shooting my horror film <laughs> all, of that, all of that was just a very strange uh, uh conversation <laughs> yeah, I thought it was kind of funny too. I mean, some of the dialogue is is actually kind of well done. I I I kind of like some of those dialogues between Betty and Marco. Anyways, we're we're kind of getting besides the I, point. I here. mean, uh, well, again, this is the moments where I'm like, oh, I think maybe this was supposed to be a comedy. Um, I was surprised. So another thing, per perhaps before leaving, is I was surprised that uh, you know, in a movie about the play Macbeth, or opera in this case, I guess where everyone acknowledges mm -hmm. that they're doing Macbeth. Mm -hmm. I was very surprised that um, no one called it the Scottish play, so they wouldn't have to say Macbeth. Because, you know, that's part of the, the lore. So you don't say Macbeth unless you're in the play. Oh, interesting. Okay. Gotcha. I didn't know that. Well, I think to be precise, is if you are if you are an honest if you are on a stage, you are not supposed to say Macbeth. You're supposed to call <laughs> the play the Scottish play. Huh. Okay. It's, Interesting. I mean, it's it's a superstition. I mean, obviously, none of this. Yeah. Is. Yeah. I mean, in that sense, they did a good job establishing, like, a sense of superstition around Macbeth, though. I mean, it is referenced, especially amongst Betty, like, bad luck to play Macbeth and stuff, like, or Lady Macbeth, that is. Yeah. Um, so, I, I thought that part was well done. I mean, there are parts of the dialogue and the script that I think are a little bit better than average uh, for Argento. Mm -hmm. uh, but there are also some major issues that we just talked about, too. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, so, who won the movie? Um... I mean, either the cinematographer or Argento. Not, not the Ravens. I, I, I think the Raven. I, I wouldn't be surprised that many of those Ravens died. <laughs> <laughs> Fair so enough. I I said uh, they won. Okay. Well, the, uh, yeah, I, I'll give it to Argento too. I mean, all of Argento's films are such like. He's very much like his own filmmaker. He can only do it. Uh, it has so many of his signatures there that it's hard to give it to anyone else. Um, so last question, rating and, uh, yeah, rating. And then I have one just quick follow up after that. 
Um, I give it a seven and a half. Okay. I give it an eight and a half. I think parts of this are as good as anything Argento has done. And then parts of it just, like, take me a little bit out of it. The heavy metal music, I think. I think if Argento used music as well as he did in, like, Deep Red and uh, some of his earlier works here, I think I'd probably rank it up, up there. Um, and the ending, I do find still to be a little annoying and frustrating because I feel like it wouldn't take too much to make this, like, just be up there with uh, the all-time classics for Argento. Um, yeah, so Argento, uh, we have now seen everything from the 80s that he did. So I wanted to see how you place those films in terms of rankings there. He started with Inferno, then Tenebrae, then um, Phenomena, and then this film, Opera. What's your favorite amongst oh, those? Oh, man, I do not rate, I don't remember, to be honest. Well, I mean, you're rating from memory, so rating on how well these films sit in your memory. Right, name them again. Uh, we got Inferno, uh, which you probably saw first, um, Tenebrae, Phenomena, and Opera. Do you have the least favorite amongst those? Which one is Tenebrae and which one is... Uh, phen oh, Phenomena is the, the girl with superpowers. Which one is Tenebrae? Jennifer Kama. Tenebrae is the one that's sort of futuristic. It's all kind of white. It's like the writer is coming into Rome. And so he like writes uh, mystery books, basically giallo books. Mm. And so there's a bunch of murders. Uh, yeah. Oh, wow. I remember having fun with that, but that's actually the least uh, memorable. Interesting. In, in the sense that I, I literally, I remember the beginning now, but I, I don't remember the rest. Um I think I ranked the highest Inferno. Um, okay. Um, I mean, that says something, too, because Inferno, you saw the longest go, and it stuck with you the longest, too. It's, so. I mean, to be honest, I also don't remember the plot that well, but the imagery is very stuck in my head. Inferno has a totally inconsequential plot, like yeah. even more so than Suspiria, I feel like. So who yeah, cares? I mean, I don't know the like, plot I, I just, Inferno either. Yeah, I just think of all the underwater scenes, uh, the crazy yeah, eyes, yeah, yeah. the hairy arms. Um, um, <laughs> oh, and the burning down with the uh, terrible costume. All of that, very memorable. Yeah, it's the highest. Yeah, yeah. Um, also our most listened to podcast, by the way. Oh, Second highest, uh, I might have, um, uh, Tenebrae probably, even though I don't remember very well, I don't remember having any issues with it. Um, and then this one, I think it's tied with the other one, the other one with uh, metal music. Phenomena. Yeah. Yeah. There. Yeah. Okay, fair I, enough. If, if, uh, actually, you're, if you're... anything, I put this one higher than Phenomena. Okay, yeah, your rankings are almost identical to mine. For me, uh, Phenomena is easily my least favorite of them. It's four, but I still like it a fair amount. I liked it more on the rewatch. I think it's more uneven than this film. Mm -hmm. This film, I think, concludes poorly, but other than that, it's pretty stellar. Uh, for me, this is number three, and then the other two i almost have just one a one b i like them pretty equally mm -hmm. inferno and tenebrae i think those are amongst uh argento's best so yeah uh cool well uh we are through argento in the 80s through what many people consider to be his last really good movies uh but we're not done we will go through some of his 90 movies at some point uh in a few months uh they won't be my next pick but uh yeah so thank you all for tuning in uh to film to film uh, you can send us an email, zafilmtofilm at gmail.com, or tweet at us, zafilmtofilm. Uh, we also, uh, I've been putting some of our episodes on YouTube too, so you can check that out at just uh, ZA Film to Film channel over there too. Uh, thank you all for uh, tuning in again, and uh, ciao. Ciao.